Hi, this is uh, going to deal with a chapter on um, international politics, and I want to specifically focus in on a very recent set of examples we're dealing with, and that's terrorism, something we can all relate to. To do that, I want to kind of give you an overview of a global perspective of how other people live. Then we'll focus in on the map of the general area of Afghanistan and the Middle East, and then from that we'll test a series of hypotheses about why some countries in general, and Afghanistan in particular, might want to harbor terrorists. You and I, of course, see this as the most horrible thing that we can imagine. We've suffered personal losses and our country has, has been attacked. And yet, if you look at the reasoning behind why some countries might be involved in that, it may help us figure out better foreign policy. Let's start with uh, the importance of the global perspective, and I've never done this before in one videos, but I want to read this page to you. More than six billion people live on planet Earth in cities across the countryside of 191 different nations. But imagine this vast world magically reduced to a single village of just a thousand people. If we were to pay this visit, a visit to this global village, we could quickly learn a great deal about our own much larger world. A survey of the village population would reveal some startling facts. For example, more than half, 575 of the thousand inhabitants, would be Asian, including 200 people from the People's Republic of China. Next, in terms of numbers, we would find 130 Africans, 125 Europeans, and 100 Latin Americans. North Americans, and that includes people from the United States, Canada, and Mexico, would account for just 65 villagers. If we narrow that down and you look at just America, we make up 6% of the world's population and we use up 40% of the world's non-renewable natural resources. Now you may conclude, well that's good, and others would say, well I'm not so sure it is, but if you were living in a poor village in Afghanistan and your children were starving, you might have a very different view. A longer stay in the village might afford the opportunity for careful study in the way of life and yield some startling conclusions. The people are very productive, generating a seemingly endless array of goods and services for sale. Yet most of the inhabitants can do no more than look at such treasures since half of the village total income is earned by just 120 individuals. In other words, 50% of the income is owned by 120 out of 1,000 people. Food is the village's greatest concern. Each year, village workers produce more than enough to feed everyone. Let me repeat that. Each year, the village workers produce more than enough to feed everyone, and yet you have people starving all over the place. Even so, 500 villagers, including most of the children, are poorly nourished and typically go to bed hungry. The 200 worst off residents lack food and safe drinking water, uh, re rendering them unable to work and vulnerable to life-threatening diseases. The village contains many splendid homes, but with, while the richest 60 families enjoy luxurious surroundings with every convenience, about 600 out of the thousand neighbors they have live in shanty housing that offers neither comfort nor safety. You've read in the book by now about the kids living on the uh, Mexico City trash pile, the same thing going on in, in uh, Brazil in one place. In fact, one of the policies was to officially go out and try to kill children that were living this way to get rid of them. Villages can boast of the country's, the community's many schools, including, villagers, sorry, can boast of the community's many schools, including colleges and universities. But while 75 of the village inhabitants have completed a college degree, 75 out of 1,000, and a few even have doctorates, 700 of the village's people can neither read nor write. So 70% of the world's population are illiterate right now. Finally, over its history, the people of this global village have attained notable achievements in the arts and sciences. Now, some countries have zipped out ahead of others at different times, and then they've, their civilizations have fallen, and other countries have zipped out ahead again. At one time, the Muslims, which will be very relevant today, were the leading scholars in math and science. And then the Europeans took over that status. They have imagined, imaginatively solved one after another the problems that confront the earth, taming nature and for those who look forward to gaining the capacity to travel further and more quickly with each passing generation. But these people have also learned that their growing ability to shape their surroundings comes at a high price. More than ever before, the deterioration of the physical environment threatens their well-being, and perhaps most important, the village population remains fractured by many proud divisions based on nationality, religion, language, skin color, and ethnicity. Almost constant fighting disrupts the peace of the community. Its people have yet to devise a means 
by which to control conflict before it explodes into a, another world war in continued bloodshed. All right, now let's switch gears here a little bit and get away from the reading. And let's talk about why countries like Afghanistan might be involved in harboring terrorists. And clearly Afghanistan was harboring terrorists right and left. They were very much a seat for hiding uh, the Taliban. Now, if we focus in on this map, this is a map of the general area. And you see a lot of countries you're familiar with. For example, Saudi Arabia is a huge country that's a friend of ours. And keep in mind, of course, that most of the people who did the 9-11, uh, running the airplane in 9-11 into the, uh, the tower, Twin Towers in New York City, came from what country? They came from our friend's country, Saudi Arabia. They didn't come from Iraq, and they didn't come from Afghanistan. They came from Saudi Arabia. There were a few from a few other countries. You'll notice Iran. And of course, over the years, we've had Iran-Iraqi wars, and we've taken different sides at different times. Uh, we have Turkmenistan. And one of the interesting countries up here is Uz Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has vast oil reserves. And here is Afghanistan. Landlocked, some major lakes, mountains. Uh, they don't have tremendous natural resources, and they're living at a, a very simple technological level on average. But one of the interesting things is, prior to our war in Afghanistan, we could not negotiate an oil pipeline from Uzbekistan across Afghanistan out to the sea. And that was one of the goals, of course, to accomplish. Now here's Pakistan, who eventually became an ally in this current, current war. And then you've got India and so forth. But notice that Afghanistan is landlocked and right in the middle here. Now let's take a look at the average life of somebody who's in Afghanistan. And any time we deal with averages, of course, we're distorting things because everybody's life's not like that. You do have some wealthy people and you've got people poorer than I'm about to describe. But if you compare the United States and Afghanistan on some key factors, you find some startling things. Out of a thousand infants born, how many die in the United States in childbirth? Well, about 6.8. That seems like a lot to us. 6.8 out of a thousand babies die in childbirth. This is, is a modern nation with incredible medical facilities. In Afghanistan, what would you guess it to be? 149.3 babies die per thousand. So clearly on this one simple, most basic of statistics, the average Afghan's life is much worse than your and my life. If we look at life expectancy, the average U.S. life is about 77 years. The average Afghani will live to be about 46 years, and this is prior to this current war even. Per capita income in the United States, it's a little over $31,000 a year. That means the average income per person, meaning a whole bunch of people make less than that, and a whole bunch of people make a whole lot more than that, so these averages do distort. But $700 a year is the per capita income for an Afghani. Now clearly the cost of living is not the same, but you can see the vast differences in lifestyle. And then finally, something as basic as education, and you must keep in mind when you look at this that the current Afghan, or the previous Afghan government under the Taliban had prohibited women from being educated. Prior to that, you had women who were educated at various levels, a few women who had been educated in college and were doctors and so forth. But the average education in the United States is a 12th grade education. The average education in Afghanistan is a second grade education. So just looking at those factors, we can immediately get the idea not that this in any way justifies the horrible events that have occurred, but can we begin to understand that a lot of the world doesn't live in the luxury that you and I just take for granted? Have we worked hard and earned it? Probably. But if you were an Afghani mom and you'd lost your infant son or daughter, or you had this kind of income or this low life expectancy, you might be very prone to being propagandized that some terrorist is going to offer you something to either get revenge on the powers of the world or to get your fair share as you perceive it. Now let's take this in a different direction. If we look at, not Afghanistan in particular, but Christian nations specifically and Muslim nations specifically, we find some interesting things. 
If we look at, at a scatter graph, which on another video you've learned how to do, how to read, uh, we've got at the bottom, um, say, a gross product per capita. And this is average income per capita, basically. It's the production measure. And on this side, we put percent Christian. In other words, as you increase your percent of Christians from low to high in a country in the world today, in those 191 countries, what happens to average income? Well, you start getting a scatter plot, it looks something like this. What's that tell us? It tells us that the higher the percent of Christians in your nation, the more likely you are to be of higher income. And you might say, well, Various explanations for that. And you've read perhaps about the Max Weber theory of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism earlier in your book. You may want to go back and, and look at that other chapter of religion. But let's change one thing here. Let's leave everything on this chart exactly the same except the numbers. And let's now talk about percent Muslim. So the percent Christian as income went up, the percent Christians went up. As the percent Muslims go up in the society, what happens to income? We well, find a negative correlation. And what this says is the per capita goes up, the percent Muslim goes down. Translation, as the percent Muslim in a nation goes up, the average income goes down. So Muslim nations in general have significantly lower income than nations that are primarily Christian. All right, now let's take a look at some of the implications for that. And one thing I want to propose here is kind of a, a simple theory, kind of a common sense one in fact. It says, nations in extreme poverty have little to lose if they harbor terrorists, right? Let's just repeat that. Nations in extreme poverty have little to lose if they harbor terrorists. What's going to happen? Well, they might actually gain some pride. They might gain some revenge on the people they perceive to be the source of their problems. Uh, they might actually... Um, uh, get some strength of unity because of who they're backing that might be, be winning at times in their perception. So let's take a look at another, another hypothesis to test. Let's test this hypothesis. Nations with lower income will have lower life expectancies in general, not just Afghanistan. So let's measure that with another scatter plot. And we've got GDP per capita, meaning income per capita, from low to high. And over here, we've got life expectancy. Now, this isn't for Afghanistan. This is for nations in general. So when we look at the amount of average income, logic would tell us, of course, what would happen to life expectancy. As it increases, we're going to have more, more people living longer. And when we look at it, that's what we get. We get a scatter plot that fits this particular pattern. And what this tells us is it's a positive correlation, and you actually have an R value, a Pearson's correlation value of 0.669. If you remember from the previous videotape on how to do this, a, a correlation means as one value goes up, the other goes up or goes down. And in this particular case, it goes up about 67%. In other words, the highest correlation you could have would be 1.0. And you have a probability, which we've talked about earlier, of 0, 0.000, meaning it's very reliable data. You're going to get this, this, these results time and time again. Hypothesis, uh, a second hypothesis let's test. Let's say that we, we want to see how people feel about themselves, if they're happy with their lives. Common sense would suggest that the poorer the nation, the less happy the people are going to be with their lives. So let's let GDP remain the same. And this time it's going to be how many people in a nation say they're very happy. And what you find again is a positive correlation in each one of these dots represents the measure of per capita income for a particular country and the measure of happiness for a particular country, country just to review there. If you look at this particular connection, uh, we find we have to do some editing here because we've left some piano. Four nations will be less happy. Okay, we find that you have a um, probability, let's see, 
an R value of not nearly as strong, but still a positive correlation of 2.87 and a probability of 0.03. What's that tell us? As income increases in a nation, common sense would suggest, and our research backs it up, people are more likely to be happy. Again, we're using this to try to get at the idea of why might other countries not be so pleased with us? Could be some jealousy, could be some, we feel that you're using our natural resources up, things of that nature. Let's try a third hypothesis here. Uh, the poorer the nation, the higher the mortality rate. So let's, for infants, so let's look at infant. We already found that for Afghanistan, and we're going to go from low again to high. And we've still got this measure of GDP from low to high. And in this case, what we find, as GDP goes up, what happens to infant mortality? As average income goes up, we get a negative correlation. So that means the poorer the nation, the higher the infant mortality rate. These are things that get on people's nerves. They don't like their babies dying any more than you and I like our babies dying. And if you look at that, we've got an R value. Uh, correlation value of uh, 0.658, again a very high one, and this is a negative 0.658, so that's a negative correlation, meaning as income goes up, infant mortality goes down. As you get to be poorer, you have a higher percentage of babies dying, and that's significant at the p-value of 0 0.000, again data that's very reliable, and you've read about some of this stuff and, and how to do it. So now we've been indicated that uh, poor nations are less happy, poor nations have lower life expectancy for the citizens, poor nations have higher mortality rates. If we did the same thing for mom's mortality, we'd, we'd find the exact same stuff. As the nation's income increases, fewer moms die in childbirth. Now let's go to a second theory, a very simple theory that's also common sense. Poor nations who are run by dictators who are not elected, who are non-democratic, tend to want to stir up anti-American feelings to keep the emphasis upon off their failures and upon, off their lavish lifestyles and focus on the problems. Now what happens when you can focus on the problems of America? If you're a dictator like Saddam Hussein, and you can say America caused all these problems, you can keep people supporting you or at least not fighting against you as long as they think there's an external evil. Let's test that idea. And we're going to test that idea in an interesting way as well. When we test that idea, what we find is that uh, on, your, on the data disk, we have a measure of freedom. And this is a rough indication of levels of involvement in democratic decision making. So it's from low to high again. And then we have the same per capita income measure. And what we find is that we'll, we'll make the hypothesis poor nations will have less, fewer freedoms or fewer democratic institutions. And what we find is a positive correlation. Again, this kind of distribution of, of, uh, of the nature. So it says as income goes up, more likely that nation will be will have democratic institutions. In other words, the citizens will get a chance to vote. They'll get a chance to have some say about who their leaders are, except not just through violent coups. So now we've found one more thing. Democracy tends to increase with the richer nations, tends to de decrease with the poorer nations. Uh, and let's take a look at another one. And this is a measure of national pride. And this is curious. One might think, that the countries that have been the most successful economically, that their citizen would have the highest rate of national pride. Well, let's test that idea. So we've got national pride from low to high, and we've got, again, income from low to high. So what we find when we look at that relationship is a negative relationship, believe it or not. In other words, as a country increases in average income for its citizens, its rating of national pride goes down. Translation, if we look at poor countries, poor countries are more likely to be chest beating about them being the best, about them having strong needs, or about them being a strong people. And of course that's used by dictators 
to keep people under control, and they often do that by blaming America for their problems. And the final one I want to look at today is, uh, is very, very similar. And it's anti-foreign feelings. Now, this was national pride. As income went up, um, as income went up, national pride went down. Now, let's look at anti-foreign feelings. And if you look around the world, one of the things dictators commonly do, as I mentioned, is they want to whip people into a frenzy and they'll find somebody to blame, whether it's Russia or China or somebody, but usually it's us because we're so darn successful. And so as, um, as uh, not national feelings, national pride goes up, but anti-foreign feelings, Oddly enough, as income increases, what happens to anti-foreign feelings? Again, we've got a negative correlation. As anti-foreign feelings go up, income goes down. In other words, people are more ethnocentric in the poorer, less educated countries. They've got more problems that we can document, such as infant mortality, mom's mortality, lower educational levels, and lower educational levels, we're presuming, are correlated with less ability to be critical thinkers when information is presented to them. So if we summarized all of this, uh, we look at a country like Afghanistan and we say um, to the surface, why in the world would they harbor Al-Qaeda? When we look a little more deeply, the question might be, what did they have to lose? They really had a chance to maybe get revenge on people they didn't like in the first place. They had dictatorial leaders who were back to about 13th century version of, of Islam. And, uh, and, and they were able to use that to their advantage. Now, just a couple closing comments here. If you ask the question, is this a Muslim against Christian Jewish sort of conflict? Well, on the surface, it certainly appears to be. And in the past, if you go back to the Middle Ages, we had all kinds of crusades and fights between Muslims and Christians and people being forced to convert to Christianity or Islam under force of threat and all that good kind of stuff. But in reality, if you look at a speech given by President Bush, George W., 9-2001, obviously this happened 9-11-01, in that speech he made a big deal of saying, are all Muslims terrorists? And he said, no, most Muslims are moderate, they're not terrorists, this is an extreme group. Now let's keep this in mind. You might react and say, and I think there's some truth to this, that, that the moderate Muslims need to stand up and denounce strongly what's going on. But let's look at Christianity. What kind of extremist groups have we had in Christianity? The KKK claims to be a Christian group. They are nothing more than a terrorist group within our nation. The Christian Brotherhood of Idaho, they claim to be a Christian group. The uh, people in Michigan, the Michigan militia, Many of them claim to be fundamentalist Christians. Now, most Christians would reject that and say that Christianity is a, Christ, is a, is a religion of peace and love and brotherhood. And these extremists don't recognize, you know, they don't uh, uh, give your views. They're just giving their own views. So keep in mind that every religion in the modern world has extremists that take certain parts of the belief system and shoves them down everybody else's throat. And I, I, I'd argue that the Al-Qaeda group is similar to that. The word jihad, for example, has been used to be a holy war. And there's a thing going on the internet this particular week that uh, talks about how the all Muslims want to commit a holy war against all Christians and Jews, and it's nothing but propaganda. If you look closely at the, uh, the email, it has to do with a prison guy in prison who is supposedly a Muslim and is very fundamentalist and is giving a very biased view of what Islam is like. If you look very closely, you find that it's one tiny view being represented here. Um, jihad has meant for most of Islam a war of psychology within the individual against the negative aspects of that person's self. And it was not conceived of most of the time as a war against others, but a war against one's own evil tendencies. In other words, trying to be a better person. So let's put this in global perspective. Lots of people don't have nearly what you and I have. Lots of people are jealous of what's, what some of the industrialized countries have accomplished. And that is probably laying the seeds for a lot of the conflict. 
That's what we got to know when we're trying to figure out how to deal with foreign policy. Thank you.